So uh, let's continue uh, uh, with the Chunky Sutta. Uh, so they have uh, just discovered that the Buddha has arrived, or someone has arrived. I don't think they know that he is the Buddha, really. There's someone with a good reputation has arrived, uh, and they all go out to meet him, which is kind of a common theme in the suttas. So then the Brahmin, this is page 18 in the book, yeah. Chanki Sutta. Uh, then the Brahmin householders of Upasada set forth from Upasada in groups and bands and headed northwards to the God's Grove, the Sala Tree Grove. Now, on that occasion, uh, the Blessed One was seated, finishing some amiable talk with some very senior Brahmins. Then the Brahmin student Kapataka said to the Blessed One. Uh, so uh, the, it is really this Kapatika and the conversation he has with the Buddha that this is about. I have cut out quite a, quite a lot of text because a lot of it is very repetitive because of the oral nature of these texts and it kind of goes on at great length. So kind of cut to the chase as they say and get, get uh, you know, down to business. So, so this is uh, what happens. So this is what he says to the Buddha. Master Gautama, in regard to the ancient Brahmanic hymns that have come down through oral tradition, uh, preserved in the collections, uh, the Brahmins come to the definite conclusion, uh, only this is true, anything else is, f is wrong. What does Master Gautama say about this? This is kind of a typical thing that you will hear, yeah, because something comes down in a religious text. This has been proclaimed by God, or this has been proclaimed by ancient Brahmins. This is the only truth, this is spoken by God, and therefore it must be true. And uh, of course, very often these d different texts, they are contradictory between each other, so you kind of have to choose a bit randomly which one to follow. Uh, and this same problem obviously applies here. Uh, so the Buddha replies, how then Bharadvaja among the Brahmins is there even a single Brahmin who says thus, I know, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong. No, Master Gautama. This is a typical thing that the Buddha always does. He brings things back to the idea of having insight into things, to seeing things directly. That is the final decider in uh, Buddhism on what is true, is whether it can actually be discovered through insight, through direct vision. Uh, this is something you see in many suttas, uh, and I will show you later on how this sutta, in many ways, it parallels the Kalama Sutta, the famous Kalama Sutta, where the Buddha says to the Kalamas, don't take your stand on traditions or logic and all these kind of things. Uh, and then he says, take your stand on what you know for yourself. Self-knowing is the final decider uh, in what is true in Buddhism. These other things matter as well, but they matter less. How then, Bharadvaja, among the Brahmins, is there even a single teacher uh, or a single teacher's teacher back to the seventh generation of teachers who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong. No, Master Gautama. How then, Bharadvaja, the ancient Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns, the composer of the hymns, those ancient, whose ancient hymns that were formerly chanted, uttered and compiled, that the Brahmins nowadays still, still chant and repeat, repeating what was spoken and reciting what was recited, that is, Ataka, Vamaka, Vamadeva, Vesamitta, Yamatagi, uh, Angirasa, Bharadvaja, Vasetta, Kasapa, and Baku. Did even these ancient Brahmin seers say thus, we know this, we see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong? Yeah? No, Master Gautama. <laughs> oh, this is, like, from the Buddha's point of view, this is not a very good answer, that's not very uh, faith-inspiring. Yeah. So Bharadvaja, it seems that among the Brahmins there is not even a single Brahmin who says, says thus, 
I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong here. And among the Brahmins there is not even a single teacher or single teacher's teachers back to the seven generations who says this. And even the ancient Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns, the composers of the hymns, even these ancient Brahmin seers did not say this. Suppose there were a line of blind men, each in touch with the next one. The first one does not see, the middle one does not see, and the last one does not see. So too, Bharadvaja, in regard to their statements, the Brahmin seemed like a file or a line of blind men. The first one does not see, the middle one does not see, and the last one does not see. What do you think, Bharadvaja? That being so, does not the faith of the Brahmins turn out to be groundless? <laughs> so this is a, is, a, is a really nice one. It's a very important and I think very significant way of thinking about teachings and religious teachings in general. Uh, because very often in the world uh, people hold on to all kinds of teachings. Uh, but when you investigate where those teachings come from, uh, the sources are often not all that impressive. Uh, yeah, who wrote these teachings? Where do they come from? Uh, and even though uh, you, know, you may claim that the teaching came from God or whatever, uh, uh, the reality often obviously is quite different. Most of these teachings were, you know, they may be ancient, handed down from an unknown source, uh, but basically we don't know where they're from. It's like a, this file of blind men. Uh, we don't know what is going on, uh, and we have no idea. And even as Buddhists, uh, when you have the Pali Canon, uh, you don't really know for sure where that Pali Canon comes from. Uh, it's a very impressive book of scriptures, uh, very consistent, uh, very inspiring in many ways, but in some ways we don't actually know for sure whether it comes from someone who is fully enlightened or not. Uh, and you will only know that for yourself when you discover the same insights, or have the same insights as the Buddha had. Then you will find out, then you will know what is going on. Uh, so this is a very applicable kind of teaching, you know, the idea of uh, being careful with where things come from, uh, understanding the source, not just believing things because other people believe it. Yeah, it just that is not really a good enough reason. Uh, you need to be a little bit uh, in this world. It's good to be a little bit rebellious and not always just kind of follow along like another sheep. If you follow along like another sheep, you end up like any other sheep. And usually, sheep don't end up in such good circumstances. Uh. So then. This Brahmin Kapatika, he says, the Brahmins honor this not only out of faith, Master Gautama, they also honor it as oral tradition. So he understands that he's on a bit shaky ground, so he takes another stand. Bharadvaja, first you took your stand on faith, now you speak of oral tradition. There are five things, Bharadvaja, that may turn out in two different ways here and now. What five? Faith, approval, oral tradition, reasoned reflection, and reflective acceptance of a view. These five things may turn out in two ways here and now. Something may be fully accepted out of faith, yet it may be empty hollow and false, but something else may be fully accepted out of faith, sorry, may not be fully accepted out of faith, yet it may be factual, true and unmistaken. Yeah, so these five things, in other words, they are not sure, yeah, these are uncertain. You may reason something, you may reflect about it, you may take it on board as faith or whatever, but in the end it is uncertain whether it is true or false. You don't really know. It's very hard to say. None of these things are kind of final deciders on what is true in the world. Uh, and these things here are very similar to what you find in the Kalama Sutta. In the Kalama Sutta you also talk about approval and oral tradition. Yeah, It's an important thing. In other words, you get something from the past, uh, some tradition from the past, the Kalama Sutta also talks about logic or reflecting on things. This is what here is 
called reasoned cogitation. Cogitation just means reflection, really, and reflective acceptance of a view. This is a kind of a thinking about things, yeah, reflecting, using logic, all of that. Using logic is also uncertain. And then there is faith. Maybe there is some teacher that you find, you know, you have confidence in, you have faith in, and that faith also sometimes is uncertain and unreliable. You don't really know. And uh, so this is, you know, if you take all of these things away, then there isn't that much left. And the only thing that really is left, and the place where the Buddha says we should place our confidence, is in ultimately in experience. Even as you start out on the path, you ask yourself if something makes sense to you. And if it makes sense to you because it fits with your experience, then you place preliminary faith, confidence in that thing. It is interesting here that even logic, yeah, even logic is kind of uh, said to be uncertain. So why is logic uncertain? Can't we sure that logic, if you are consistently logical, surely logic must be right? Uh, but that's precisely not the case. Yeah? Logic is not necessarily right. This is the problem with logic. Logic is only as good as your starting point, as your assumptions at the beginning. All logic implies certain assumptions, and then you build up the logic on those assumptions. But if your assumptions are wrong, the logic is going to be wrong. Yeah? Or the the logic steps may be true, but bec even though the steps are true because you start with the wrong assumption, the result is still wrong. Yeah? And in Buddhism, this is so important, it's fundamentally important in Buddhism, because according to Buddhism, almost e everything we think is based on the assumption of a sense of self. So whatever views that you build up out of that sense of self are going to be false, even if your logical steps themselves are perfectly valid, because you start with the wrong start point, everything turns out to be wrong. Yeah? And this is why you have to be careful even with logic. You have to make sure that your assumptions at the beginning are correct. And this is one of the reasons why the Buddha is, uh, even logic he says, we have to be careful with it. Uh, because actually what is required is an act of insight. Once you have that act of insight, uh, once you understand the nature of the mind, then you can apply logic, because then you have the foundation for applying logic. Uh, then you can use it. But unless the assumption is right, it's not going to work out. Uh, it's a very profound truth behind that. Yeah. Uh, another, uh, another more ordinary example of how logic is kind of biased and often doesn't work is when we had the bhikkhuni ordination. Yeah, you can you could read all these papers about bhikkhuni ordination. Some people will say it's valid. Some will say it's invalid. Uh, and if you read those papers, they were often so complex and so detailed and going into so many things uh, that you read one side of thought, yeah, they are surely right. Then you read the other side, yeah, but they're right as well, because the arguments were so persuasive on either side, and you didn't really know. And uh, you realized that the arguments were made from a pre-existing position. Some people believed that ordination of bikinis was a good thing to do, others believed it was bad, and then the logical argument was based on that. Both very strong arguments, but they were based on a certain pre decided outcome almost, where you had a position beforehand, and then the argument kind of supported that. The logic was there to support your pre-existing conditions, rather than arriving necessarily at a conclusion that was useful. Uh, I don't know if you, you know, sometimes, uh, yeah, I don't know if you had read any of those arguments, but if you did, uh, you will see that that's the case, and it's often like that, yeah? You, the, it's impossible from the argument itself to decide who is right, because both sides seem equally valid. Uh, and uh, often you have to look at the underlying values to understand why the argument is the way it is. Uh, so logic has certain limitations in this way. Yeah. So um, anyway, yeah, so all of this turns out wrongly. So obviously the Buddha here is saying to this Kapatika, be careful, yeah, watch out. Uh, and uh, don't be too quick in kind of uh, the Brahmanical faith may not be founded properly. It must, must be kind of scary to be a Brahmin being told all of this stuff. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe you should do something about that. Uh. <coughs> so, and then the Buddha goes on with all of these other things, saying all of these things may turn out one way or the other. Again, something may be fully approved of, uh, may be well transmitted, well reflected on, uh, yeah, or, or well contemplated or, or cogitated it has here, yet it may be empty 
hollow and false, but something else may not be well reflected upon, yet it may be factual, true and unmistaken. Under these conditions it is not proper for a wise man who preserves truth to come to the definite conclusion only this is true, anything else is false or wrong. And then Kapatika asks, but Master Gautama, in what way then is there the pre preservation of truth? How does one preserve truth? We ask Master Gautama about the preservation of truth. If everything is so uncertain, how do you preserve truth? And the Buddha replies, if a person has faith, Bharadvaja, he preserves truth when he says, my faith is thus. But it has not yet come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. In this way, Bharadvaja, there is preservation of truth. In this way, he preserves the truth. In this way, he descri we describe the preservation of truth. But as yet, there is no discovery of truth. So, uh, the point here, again, is this idea that we, some, we need to know sometimes whether we have faith in something or whether we have knowledge. And it's good to make that distinction in our lives. If you make that distinction in your life, actually life becomes much better as a consequence. So as Buddhists, yeah, we, there's a lot of things we have to admit. We have faith in, we don't really know. What are the things that you, well the things that you know is that if you meditate in a certain way you become peaceful. If you act with kindness in the world you tend to feel better about yourself. Some of these things are very obvious. Uh, but a lot of the deeper things on the path we have faith in. We don't really know. Most people don't know if there is such a thing as a jhana state. You may think it, it's obvious, yeah, well if you keep on going deeper and deeper, eventually you must get there. It may seem obvious in some way, but you can't be absolutely sure. It's based on faith. Yeah, deep insight, becoming an arahant, is that possible? Okay, most people don't know. It's also based on faith, yeah, or confidence in the suttas. There may be good reasons for thinking it, based on the suttas, but still, it is faith, ultimately. Rebirth, kamaha. Yeah, many of these things, psychic powers, a lot of these things are based on faith. We don't really know whether these things are true or not. And actually it's quite nice when you start thinking like that. Because if someone else challenges you about rebirth, and they say that you are you're just superstitious, you believe in rebirth, sometimes people say these things, you can say, yeah, maybe, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And you can just shrug your shoulders, because actually you don't really know. You realize that you have faith, and so you can shrug your shoulders, and straight away it takes away so much of that defensiveness there. You don't really have to argue for it, uh, yeah, because it is uncertain. Of course, the other person who challenges you, it's not that they know any more, they may know even less than you, but uh, so they are equally uncertain, yeah, about whatever they believe in, uh, but at least you are honest about it, uh, and that's good. Uh, you have less arguments in the world, yeah, you shrug your shoulders, yeah, this makes sense to me from what I see. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure yet, uh, so it's okay. So this is the advantage of not being dogmatic about things and believing things more strongly than we actually know, uh, understanding the difference between faith and knowledge, yeah? And acknowledging that, and that's okay. When we do that, often it makes life much better. Yeah? This is one of the kind of nice things about this. And the Buddha says, if we admit this, that this is my faith but not my knowledge, Actually, this is a way of preserving the truth, he says right here. We don't go further than the evidence. If a person approves of something, if they receive an oral tra tradition, if he reaches a conclusion based on reasoned contemplation, if he gains a reflective acceptance of a view, he preserves truth when he says, my reflective acceptance of a view is thus. But he does not yet come to the definite conclusion, <coughs> only this is true. A anything else is wrong. In this way too, Bharadvaja, there is preservation of truth. In this way he preserves truth. In this way he we describe the preservation of truth. But as yet there is no discovery of truth. 
And the Kapatika replies, in that way, Master, Go Master Gautama, there is a preservation of truth. In that way, one preserves the truth. In that way, one re we recognize the preservation of truth. But in what way, Master Gautama, is there the discovery of truth? In what way does one discover truth? We ask Master Gautama about the discovery of truth. So you have started out with faith, yeah? And then, how do you discover the truth? And this is the interesting part, because this is where really the uh, training comes in, what we are supposed to do to discover the truth in this world. So this is the kind of thing that we are trying to do on the Buddhist path. Yeah? This is what comes now. This is really the path. This is where the real action is. Here, Bharadvaja, a bhikkhu, a bhikkhuni, maybe a lay, maybe a pasaka, an upasaka, may live in dependence on some village or town. Then a householder or householder's son or householder's child <coughs> goes to him and investigates him in regard to three kinds of qualities. In regard to qualities based on greed, in regard to qualities based on ill will, in regard to qualities based on delusion or confusion. Are there in this venerable one any such qualities based on desire that with his mind obsessed by those qualities while not knowing he might say I know and while not seeing he might say I see or he might urge others to act in a way that would lead to the harm and suffering for a long time. So uh, here you have a bhikkhu living in dependence of the village or the town. This is like the bhikkhu life. You live dependence means you live as an alms mendicant. You get supported by the people in that town or village. And of course here the Buddha is talking a bit about himself. Yeah, so this is that the bhikkhu is really the Buddha in this case. Obviously he, he is one of them anyway. And then someone, yeah, this is kind of any one of us. This is what we should do. If you want to find out whether this spiritual teacher is a good one or not, this is how we should find out. This is like one of those criteria for deciding who is worthy of faith and worthy of confidence in this world. So you should investigate that person, that teacher, in regard to three things. Whether they have loba, dosa or moha. Yeah? Here translated as greed, hate and delusion is actually not a very good translation at all. Uh, because uh, greed is a very strong form of desire. You want to amass more for yourself. Hate is a very strong negative emotion. Delusion is not so bad, but that even may, may be, can perhaps be uh, improved upon. Uh, so these words, loba, mosa, doa, really just mean desire, yeah, that you desire stuff, you want things, whatever that is. Uh, greed is really too strong, I think, in these particular contexts. Uh, hate also is way too strong. Dosa is just any kind of ill will, yeah, any kind of anger or negativity that you may have, uh, from, uh, from anything, basically. The reason why someone like Bhikkhu Bodhi uses these very strong words, uh, uh, this is Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, by the way, is because of the way, the scheme that he uses to translate. It's important to understand this, I think, that when a translator translates, they have a certain scheme. And that scheme is one Pali word has one English translation. Uh, yeah, this is how the scheme works. In this way, you create consistency in your translation. So every time you come to a Pali word, you translate it to an English word. Uh, but that, that kind of way of translating has big problems because it means, it means a number of things. It means that if another, another word it has already been translated by a certain English word, you cannot use that word again. So if desire has already been tr used to translate karma, for example, yeah, which means desire, sensual desire, you cannot also use it to translate loba because it's already been taken. So you have to find something else. And then when you want to find something else, you end up with a word that may not be quite applicable. Yeah? And this is the problem with these translation schemes. They're often not flexible enough. Uh, another problem with these translation schemes is that the Pali word may not match exactly with an English word. 
a Pali word may have a broader meaning. It may have different kinds of meaning mm. than you have in English. So if you consistently translate a Pali word with one specific English word, you may end up with quite a misleading translation sometimes. So it's important to be aware of that. I don't know if you are interested in the technicalities of translation, but because I do a bit of translation, I sort of have to think about these things sometimes. So for these reasons, you, you know, your translation is actually quite difficult to get it accurate. Uh, and uh, I have personally, when I translate, I've been translated in the Vinaya Pitaka uh, to be published not so long in the future. And, but that, uh, when you do that, I prefer to translate in a way where actually the meaning is as transparent as possible rather than having rigid schemes. Uh, that also has certain disadvantages and many people will no doubt criticize me for doing that, but it's kind of at least it, it doesn't have this kind of problem to it. So remember that when you read these things, uh, the, you know, it may not always be 100% ideal, the translation. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind, it's useful. Uh, uh, sometimes you may, may read an alternative translation and it gives you a slightly different angle on something. Yeah. Can be, can be can be handy. Anyway, I'm just trying to bring these things out. Don't worry too much about it. Uh, it's a bit of a sidetrack, really. And um, so you ask, does he have this kind of desire that he might say, I see, what in fact he does not see? Yeah, in other words, he is kind of pretending to be more than he actually is. And then he would urge others to act in a way that would lead to their harm, because uh, if he thinks he knows, or he says he knows, but he doesn't, uh, then he might actually urge other people to do actions, but in fact he doesn't know, so he doesn't know if those actions are useful. Uh, yeah? That's why it is important to have a good teacher. Uh, choose the wrong teacher, you may be led down the garden path, you may end up with tremendous suffering. Uh, and this is something we see in the world of spirituality. Uh, there's a lot of fake gurus around, uh, a lot of dodgy characters, uh, and very often you end up with people really traumatized by hanging out with those gurus and dodgy characters. Uh, they take them advantage of them in all kinds of ways, financially or physically or whatever it is, uh, and they end up traumatized rather than being uplifted uh, by such gurus. Uh. So it is important to investigate, it's important to be honest, it's important to be clear-eyed about the pitfalls and downfalls of some of the spiritual teachers. Uh. Otherwise we end up making mistakes. And also, it is our duty to inform others. Uh, if there is a dodgy teacher, it's our duty to inform other people about those, those dodgy teachers. Uh, yeah, we shouldn't be afraid of that. Uh. As he investigates him, he comes to know there are no such qualities based on desire in this Venerable One. Uh, the bodily behavior and the verbal behavior of this Venerable One are not those of one affected by desire. Uh. And the Dhamma that this Venerable One teaches is profound, hard to see, hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle to be experienced by the wise. This Dhamma cannot easily be taught by one affected by desire. So you listen to the teachings of somebody who can really explain deep samadhi and deep insight in a very convincing way, and you get the feeling that it is their own experience, well then, you know, then, then uh, it is unlikely to have anything to do with greed, etc. And this is kind of the point here. Yeah. Of course, you have to be careful, because sometimes, again, people can be good, they can talk, yeah, they have read about jhana in the suttas and they can kind of talk about jhanas, uh, but actually uh, that doesn't always mean that they have any experience. So even then you have to be careful. Yeah. When he has investigated him and has seen that he is purified in terms, in, in states based on desire, he next investigates him in regard to states based on ill will. Are there in this Venerable One any qualities based on ill will, such as with his mind obsessed by those states, uh, he might urge others to act in a way that would lead to their harm and suffering for a long time. Or he might say, I know while he does not know, and he might say, I see when he doesn't see him. As he investigates him, he comes to know there are no such qualities based on ill will in this Venerable One. Uh, the bodily behavior and verbal behavior of this Venerable One are not 
those of one affected by ill will. And the Dhamma that this Venerable One teaches is profound to be experienced by the wise. This Dhamma cannot easily be taught by one affected by ill will. Yeah? Can I ask a question? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Ajahn, uh, with regards to your say, you're saying just now that the words loba dosa moha to, uh, if you directly translate them to mean greed, hate, and delusion, yeah. and ju you're just now saying that these words were. Uh, in the English translations are stronger and have a connotation that's more negative? Um, no, I, th I, think the, the, the I think these translations that are given here are too negative. Huh? Right. Yeah, they don't necessarily mean greed and hatred and delusion. They can mean lesser things than that. Uh, any kind of ill will would be included in dosa. Any kind of desire would be included in loba. It doesn't have to be kind of hatred, which is a very strong, strong term in English. So in reading these uh, paragraphs, uh, are we to look at the three, uh, loba, dosa, moha, as a whole, to mean desire for anything? Uh, are, we, are we to s look at it from that angle, or are we to, uh, again, the, the words hate as used here, or the uh. words ill will are used here, are, are they... Are, they, are we just to see that they are actually meaning that we should investigate the uh, the person mm. in relation to whether they have any of these states? Yeah, or yeah, not? yeah, yeah. So any any kind of any degree of uh, ill will is obviously kind of uh, problematic if you're supposed to be an arahant. Yeah, it's not just hatred. It doesn't have to be very strong ill will. Any degree is bad. So this is kind of the point here, is that if you see any of these things, uh, then you already have grounds for having doubts about these things. Uh, yeah, that's exactly the point. Uh, I just wanted to make that point, because otherwise it may seem that uh, someone can have be a little bit angry and it's still okay, but uh, actually <laughs> no degree of anger is really, is really acceptable. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and, and, and what this does, what is interesting about all of this, it puts the onus back on each one of us. Uh, to make sure that we have the good teacher, yeah? We all have the, our kind of responsibility to ourselves and our friends and anyone else that we give advice to about these things, uh, to make sure that we actually investigate properly. We really are careful with these things. We don't do these things too easily. We don't listen to the crowd necessarily. We don't listen to our friends necessarily when they say, go, to <laughs> go and listen to a particular talk or whatever. Uh, but we are open. We, we don't reject things straight away either. We are just, we, we try to be wise about these things. And so this idea of self-responsibility, taking responsibility for ourselves, is just so important in the, in the Dhamma. It's too easy just to follow along other people, but trust your own judgment. Yeah? If you, because in the end you have to trust your judgment anyway. Whatever you do in life, you ultimately you are in charge. So trust your judgment about these things. If you are careful, if you are reasonably humble about your own abilities, uh, uh, you will be able to make quite good judgments. Uh, and uh, uh, trust that, uh, because you have to trust that. You don't have any choice. Uh, in the end, uh, you are going to be the one who decides uh, how you're going to live your life, what you have to do. Uh, so you have no choice in that. Uh, I've heard people say that, uh, oh, I don't really know, so I have to trust other people's judgment. Uh, yeah. People say, oh, I don't know who is Narayan, but he says he's Narayan, so, so because he is very wise, he must be right, so I will follow what he says. But how do you decide he is wise? Who decides that? You decide that. In the end, it is still your decision, yeah? It's just that you are kind of putting your faith in someone else, intermediary, and that doesn't make any difference. The problem is still the same. Ultimately, it always falls back on you. You are the one who has to decide these things. So make it more direct rather than make it indirect because you're just kind of fooling yourself otherwise. Uh, let's go on to the uh, last one. Same thing again. When he has investigated him and seen that he is purified from those states of uh, desire and ill will, he next investigates him in regard to qualities based on delusion. 
are the indispensable one and the qualities based on delusion, such that with his mind obsessed by those qualities, uh, he might ur urge others to act in a way that would lead to the harm of suffering for a long time. As he investigates him, he comes to know there are no such qualities based on delusion in this venerable one. Uh, or you can say maybe confusion, yeah, that's more a more easily understandable word, uh, which uh, in this context might fit better. The bodily behavior and verbal behavior of this venerable one are not those of one affected by confusion. Uh, and the Dhamma that this venerable one teaches is profound to be experienced by the wise. This Dhamma cannot easily be taught by one affected by confusion. When we talk about delusion, uh, very often it means the very profound misunderstandings, yeah, the seeing a self where there is no self, seeing permanence when there is things are impermanent and these kind of things. But here it must mean something less than that, because these are ordinary people investigating a teacher. So here it means something like uh, uh, confusion, yeah, or maybe being kind of slightly insane maybe even, yeah, being really kind of don't really know what you're doing, very restless perhaps. Uh, if you see someone who's very restless, it's not really all that faith inspiring. Uh, these kind of things. Someone who has a lot of doubt, yeah, will also be a kind of confusion in a sense. Uh, so these are the things you would look for in a, a spiritual teacher. Uh. So this is the first thing you do. Uh. So what happens then? Once you have seen all of these things, yeah, this is when it gets interesting. When he has investigated him uh, and he has seen that he is purified from qualities based on uh, qualities of desire, ill will and confusion, then he places faith or confidence in, in him. Uh, sada, yeah, is the Pali word for faith here. So then you place faith. In fact, you don't really need to place the faith. The, pla the faith pretty happens automatically. You don't really have to kind of say, okay, now, from now on, I will have faith. It kind of just happens, yeah? One thing leading to another. Huh? It's just natural. Huh? So uh, faith is a very nice word in Pali, the Pali word sadha. And in Pali, the one of the nice translations of the word sadha is actually confidence. Uh, Faith in English is often very closely related to Christianity and uh, those kind of religions uh, and very often it has this uh, idea of you know blind faith and all of these kind of things uh, but here it is more a faith that is reasoned. Yeah, you have gone through this whole process which is very reasonable. Uh, is this person special because of these qualities? Then you place, it's better to call that confidence than call it faith uh, because you have a grounded you have grounds for having that confidence. Uh, and so that is a better way of looking at it. Uh. But there is another way in which it is also closer to faith. Uh, because the idea of faith in English uh, has an uh, element of emotion to it. Uh. If you have strong faith in something, uh, uh, very often in Christianity as well, it is like an uplifting emotion. Uh. This is why people like to have faith in God and all of this, because it actually gives you a good feeling when you have faith. Uh. And that feeling is also something that comes with the Buddhist idea of sadha. When you have faith in something profound and beautiful, when that faith becomes strong, the feelings come with that. Uh, they're called in the suttas elsewhere the Atta Veda and Dhamma Veda. And the word Veda is the related to Vedana and Vedeti. Uh, and uh, <coughs> the, this word actually means feeling. Yeah, Vedana is feeling, positive feeling, negative feeling, all of that. Uh, here it means positive feeling. And Veda is also related to the word vijjati or vijja, which is understanding. Yeah? So it's understanding and feeling coming together. And this is why this is so powerful and so useful. Uh, because when understanding and feeling comes together, it is feeling based on reality, feeling based on something really worthwhile, having positive feeling towards her. Uh. It is not just blind faith or empty faith, feelings that are not based on anything, uh, but it's both. Uh. And so Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, he translates the Atta Veda, Dhamma Veda, I think as inspiration. In Atta is the meaning or the goal or the purpose. Uh. So inspiration in the goal, uh, where we're going, uh. yeah, what we're heading towards. You start to understand that we're heading towards something remarkable here. Uh. 
we're actually getting out of trouble, we're getting out of problems, uh, and we're heading towards more contentment and happiness in our lives. Uh, wow, that's pretty, pretty good, isn't it? Uh, and this is what the Dhamma gives you. Uh, so you get inspired and enthusiastic about the meaning of these teachings, uh, because you know they are the answer to the meaning of life. This is what everyone wants. Uh, the Dhamma Veda is then the feeling of Dhamma, of the teachings lying behind that, that lead to that goal, that lead to that great goal. So then also those teachings will inspire you in the same way, <coughs> precisely because they lead to that goal. So this is what Sadha is about. So Sadha should also be, um, should be this mixture of confidence and emotion. Yeah, That's what it is. So it's hard to translate it into English because Faith emphasizes the emotion, whereas confidence uh, emphasizes the more intellectual side. So you need to marry these two things together, and then you kind of get the right idea of what faith is about. Uh, this is ideally how it works. <coughs> so, uh, he places faith in him. Filled with faith, he then goes to him. Uh, he visits, this really approaches him. Then when he approaches him, he kind of sits down with him. Yeah, the Pali word is Pairupasati, uh, which is like to uh, sit next to. Yeah, it's like, um, almost means like to visit. So you go to him and it's like you visit them, you sit next to them. Yeah, and of course when you sit next to them, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation is a bit different here. I, I don't really 100% agree. Or it can be viewed in different ways anyway. So having then visited them, being with them, of course then you get to hear, yeah? You give ear because you have faith. When you have confidence in somebody that the teaching is important, you naturally want to hear what they have to say. It becomes interesting. That's what he giving ear really means. It means that you're interested. Huh? You want to hear what's going on. Huh? And because you give ear, you hear the Dhamma. And because you are interested in that Dhamma, when you hear it, you kind of memorize it. And because you memorize it, then you have the chance to examine the meaning as a consequence. And uh, <coughs> this is one of those important aspects of Buddhism that is often perhaps not emphasized enough, I think, is the idea of reflecting on these teachings. What do they actually mean? Yeah, what do they mean to me? What are they wha in my life? What exactly? How does the, these teachings kind of um, uh, intertwine with my life? Where do I see these things in my life? Uh, 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 to see in these teachings, uh, and once you kind of make sense of these teachings in terms of your own life, then it really comes alive, uh, because you see what is happening here. Uh, yeah, you can see almost these things being realities in your own existence. So it's good to reflect on these teachings, yeah? And in the suttas it is often, here you see an example of it where examination and reflection is really kind of brought to the fore and made important. Uh, it actually goes very quickly here through the sequence to awakening, happens very fast. And reflection is one of the main things that you see in this passage. It comes up again a bit further down. Uh, so this idea of reflecting on the teachings uh, matters enormously. Uh, and why it matters so much is exactly the same reason why I've been focusing on this retreat on the Four Noble Truths, understanding them in the terms of right view. Uh, because once you have that right view, then everything else follows automatically. Uh, yeah, once you see things in the right way, then it's easy. You, it almost happens by default that you go ahead in the right direction. Uh, the reason why a stream enter always practices the path is because they have fully right view. They have come be been fully brainwashed. Yeah, they, ha they have no choice anymore. They're going to practice that path. And the more that right view is there, the more obvious it is. This is how you have to live. This is what you have to do. Why? Because this leads to happiness. Everything else uh, can often lead to lots of suffering. Yeah. So getting that. Reflecting on these things, understanding what they mean, understanding why the world is often letting you down, why it is problematic, why happiness is to be found on the path. If you get that, if you understand why the world is problematic, why happiness is to be found on the spiritual path, then it's a no-brainer. It's obviously you're going to do this, yeah? It's, why would you want to do anything else? It doesn't make any sense anymore. Everything you pursue in your life, you pursue it because you think it's going to make you happy. Isn't that right? 
Do, does anyone here pursue stuff that you think is going to make you miserable? That doesn't make any sense, right? You just don't do that. Uh, you don't. If there's a hot plate there, it's hot. You don't put your hand on the hot plate and say, yeah, pain, Whoa, hooray. Nobody does that. Uh, you take it away, straight away. Uh, we all want happiness. So if you understand that happiness is on the spiritual path, not in the worldly things, you're going to remove, just as you remove your hand from the hot plate, you're going to remove your life out of the ordinary life and start going more towards the spiritual things. It's just automatic, because you know what is painful and what is not, what is pleasurable. This is how simple it is. That's, and that is why right view is so important. Yeah. It's very easy to have right view about the hot plate. Everybody has right view about that. Uh, bleeding obvious, it's hot. <laughs> Don't even think about it. Uh, but to have right view about the bigger issues in life is more difficult. Uh, and that's why it takes a lot of reflection, careful thinking, understanding what is going on, and then you start to head in the right direction. Uh, does it make sense what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah. And this is why reflection here, again, is emphasized so much in the Buddhist teachings. <coughs> okay, so you examine the meaning, and when you examine the meaning, you gain a reflective acceptance of those teachings. Yeah, Reflective acceptance just means that you start to accept the Dhamma because you have reflected on it, and it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense, okay, so you start to accept them based on that reflection. That's really all it means. Uh, so uh, they make sense, and then, because they make sense to you, then it says here, zeal springs up. Zeal is chanda in Pali. Chanda means this desire. You want to practice, yeah? You want to do this. You want to do those things that make you happy. You want to become a better person. You want to be more kind in your life because you know kindness is the way to happiness both for you and also for others. Once you get that, wh what else can you possibly do if you know that this is the, this is the case? And then that chanda is that desire that pushes you forward uh, to practice in the right way, to do what is right. Uh, yeah, in, uh, in the Itapadas you even have the Chanda Samadhi, the Samadhi based on this kind of wholesome desire that gets you started, gets you to sit down and do some practice. Uh, and then that, so this Chanda is a wholesome kind of desire that leads to wholesome result. Uh, <coughs> In the, the word desire is ambiguous. Desire can be bad, but desire can also be good, depending on what you desire. Yeah, It's an ambiguous word, and the same thing with chanda. Chanda is also this ambiguous word. can be good or bad, depending on what it is that you desire. Certain desires are always bad. Tanha is always bad. Tanha means precisely unwholesome desire, craving. Yeah, That's why it's often translated as craving, because by definition it is an unwholesome desire. Karma, also an unwholesome desire, because it is a desire for sensual things of the world, uh, and it doesn't lead you anywhere on the path. Uh. So you want to practice, because you've seen things in the right way, you have that right view, you understand where real happiness is, uh, so you want to apply yourself to that, and that wanting to apply yourself is the chanda. You want to go there, you want to do this. Uh. And then once you do that, uh, you start to Act accordingly, because you want, you start to act. This is us, usahati in Pali. Usahati just means to exert yourself. Yeah, You start exerting yourself. So what does that mean, to exert yourself? It means that you stop killing animals. Yeah, You start practicing the five precepts, that's, it, that's exerting yourself. It doesn't take a lot of effort, it just takes a little, little bit of wisdom. And you start practicing the five precepts. You start to reflect, how can I be more kind to people. How can I think about people with more metta? How can I avoid ill will and negativity in my life? This is how you start to think, and because you start to think like that, you put in the effort to avoid those things. Of course, you need a bit of guidance on how to do it, because it may not be obvious how to overcome ill will, but once you start to understand how to overcome ill will, it's not that hard. Surprisingly easy to overcome ill will if you understand the methods. Uh, I'm going to talk more about this later on because this is one of the really fundamental aspects of Buddhism, the ability to overcome ill will and anger. Uh, 
So this is where the energy gets put in. Yeah, this is what right effort is all about. Yeah, this effort we're talking about here. You put forth, you exert yourself. He has here applies the will. Okay, maybe applies the will, but it means that you exert yourself. Yeah, and uh, then you scrutinize is the next one. Uh, or the Pali literally is tuleti. Tuleti means to measure. Uh, yeah. So m measuring uh, here refers to the idea of like of uh, comparing. Yeah. You measure things up. Uh, you compare them. You look at them from different perspectives. Uh, you compare specifically what you compare. You compare the suttas to your own practice. You use the suttas as your guide or Dhamma teachings as your guide, then you practice according to that, you go back to the suttas to see if it matches, am I heading in the right direction? And in this way, using the teachings, using your own practice together, you build up. Yeah. So this again is really about reflecting on the suttas again, because you're using the suttas as a guide, you're measuring what you're doing, you're deciding whether it is right or not. This is the idea here of to let it, to measure, to scrutinize, to compare, to find out what is actually happening here. So a lot using this guidance of the suttas all the way through, yeah? Even after you become a stream mentor, even after you're independent of others in the world, still you use the suttas in the same way to support you in your practice. And uh, then once you so you keep on doing this, then, then the next one here is that you strive, yeah, resolutely you strive. Uh, this is just another way to say you put forth effort again. Uh, the uh, Pali is uh, padahati, this is padana, the same word you find in the sixth factor of the, of the path. Uh, samma padana, right effort, again, you, you put in the right effort. Uh, what is that right effort? And again, often very simple things, you sit down, on your bottom and you watch the breath, yeah, that's the right effort. And you allow your mind to become peaceful, that's the right effort. You don't interfere in the meditation practice, that's the right effort. You kind of guide your mind a little bit, that's the right effort. So this simple little things like that is what right effort is about. So, yeah, and um, then we're coming to the very end here. If you keep on practicing that right effort, and you realize with the body the supreme truth, uh, and you see it by penetrating it with wisdom. So this here is a reference to the supreme truth here, uh, is the uh, <coughs> parama satcha, yeah, parama, the highest truth. So you realize the highest truth, and this is a reference to stream entry. That is the first time you penetrate and you see that highest truth with wisdom. So here you have become a stream enter. So this thing we have just been through now, yeah, this is another way of looking at the Noble Eightfold Path. It may not be obvious to you, but this actually is the Noble Eightfold Path spoken about in a different way. So if you Look at that whole thing, that whole um, whole uh, section there. There's a lot of emphasis on right view and right intention, right thought. All the beginning stages there are about that. Yeah. First of all, you have faith. The right kind of faith is actually an aspect of right view. Faith and right view and wisdom are very closely related in Buddhism. So that is a kind of view. Yeah. Then. You listen to those teachings, you memorize them, you examine the meaning, and you gain a reflective acceptance of those teachings. All of that is about right view. Yeah, listening to the Dhamma, thinking about it, uh, understanding what it is all about. All of this is an aspect of right view. You are kind of moving away from your ordinary view, starting to align your view, make your view uh, uh, congruent or equal or, or approximate to that of the Buddha. That's what you're doing here, gradually, gradually, gradually. Understanding the world in a new way. Where should I really look for happiness? Where should I look for end of suffering and contentment? I used to look, at, look for it over here. Didn't really work. Everyone else also is looking for happiness over there. Nobody seems all that happy. Huh? Yeah, it doesn't really matter how rich you are or not. Yeah, still p p people pretty miserable. Huh? I don't know about you, but I, as a monk, sometimes you get to meet really, really wealthy people. Huh? Yeah, but just like everyone else, there's no difference. 
It's kind of weird. Everyone in the world wants to be wealthy, but when you meet these people, they have exactly the same problems as everyone else. What's the point of being wealthy? It's just meaningless. Yeah, it doesn't actually get you anywhere. So you start to say, okay, let me look for happiness somewhere else. Let me instead just sit down on my bottom, watch my breath. People think you're crazy, yeah? Because that is, how can that possibly be the path to happiness? But this is the point. If other people think you are crazy for doing something, very likely to be true, because most people haven't got a clue where to find happiness. Uh, so sitting on your bottom watching your breath, actually, that might actually be the answer, yeah? Precisely because it is out of the ordinary, yeah? So <laughs> this is what makes it interesting. And of course, many of you will know precisely why this works. Uh, it works precisely because you go against the stream of craving. Uh, so all of this is part of the right view here, this moving away from the ordinary way of thinking about the world, changing around, looking at things in another way, and suddenly it opens up vistas, it opens up an idea of the world which is so different from everyone else. And then when that view is in place, then the chanda springs up, the chanda here, <coughs> the desire to act, and that is like the Samma Sankappa, the right intention, the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah? whereby you aim for something else, the desire to act comes from that new aim, the new purpose. So, that, so, so this here is very much focused on right view, and only towards the very end are we talking about the actual practical uh, aspects of the path. Then once you have that Samma Sankappa, the Chanda, then you apply your will, it says here, or your usahati, you kind of, you, you apply yourself yeah, to the teaching. And that, of course, is very much part of the next factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. Samavacha, right speed, samakamanta, right action, samajiva, right livelihood, samapadana, right effort, or sometimes called samavayama, right, also right effort. Yeah, all of that is part of this ap you're applying yourself. Uh, and as you are applying yourself, you always review what you are doing. You compare it to the suttas. You scrutinize, as it says here. You measure things. To leti, uh, yeah. This is also part of this right effort uh, that we do as we go along, uh, checking things out. Uh, and then, as you check things out and you see it's working, uh, this path is actually going in the right direction. Something is changing inside of me. I've been a monk for 25 years, and it's been a steady change all the way along, moving upwards on this path all the way along. And this is why I'm still a monk, because it's feeling of progress as you go, go along. And so then you s when you see that, uh, you keep on uh, striving. Yeah? Then comes the padana. This is definitely a part of uh, the six-factor right effort. And then that then goes into the meditation practice, which also is right effort, uh, where you Watch your breath, yeah, the Satipatthana practice and all of that. Uh, and then eventually, when you practice the Satipatthana practice in the right way, including mindfulness of breathing, it naturally leads onto the jhanas. Uh. So all of that is kind of included here. It's everything is very compressed in this particular sutta, but that is kind of part of this, uh, how this works. If you look at how the forearm effort sometimes is described in the suttas, uh, it is described that you uh, practice the bojangas. The bojangas is one of the ways of talking about the four right efforts. Uh, remember the four right efforts, yeah? the f just briefly, the four right efforts is to, if an unwholesome quality arises, uh, you overcome it. Uh, yeah? If an unwholesome quality has already, uh, uh, yeah, if, if, if it has arisen, you overcome it. If it hasn't yet arisen, you avoid its arising in the future. Uh, if you already, uh, if you don't have a wholesome quality, you make an effort to give rise to the wholesome quality. And if a wholesome quality has already arisen, you develop it and make more of it. Uh, and this, the development and the building up of good qualities uh, is defined in the suttas as the development of the bojangas, uh, the seven factors of awakening. And the bojangas, when you pull them apart, it starts off with the Sati Sambhojanga, the mindfulness factor of awakening, it ends up with the Samadhi Sambhojanga and the Upeka Sambhojanga. So the factors of awakening are all about Satipatthana practice leading to jhana states. That's what they are. And they are part also in the expanded version of right effort. 
So this is why this right effort here can have include all of these things. If you expand it out properly, it can include all of these things. It usually doesn't, because uh, usually it is a smaller aspect of the path, but here it kind of includes all of that. Uh, and that is why, at the end of the day, you realize the truth, the parama satcha, yeah, as you see it here. Uh, and that is what how you then come to the truth. Uh, just very briefly, we're pretty much done with the sutta, but very briefly, it says here that you realize it with the body. How can you realize the supreme truth with the body? Yeah, again, this shows the limitation of the translation. Yeah, how can it, because the body doesn't make any sense in English to translate with the body. And to understand this, you have to understand the Pali word behind this is kayena. And kayena is used, and this is a very typical case, as direct experience. Uh, so what it really means is that you have the direct, personal, immediate experience uh, of the highest truth yourself. Uh, then you become a stream enter. Uh, yeah, this is what this really is referring to. Uh. So uh, uh, then the Buddha says to him, in this way, Bharadvaja, there is discovery of truth. In this way, one discovers the truth. In this way, we describe the discovery of truth. Uh, but as yet, there is no final arrival of truth. Uh, so let's read out the very last paragraph briefly. It's getting a little bit over time, but uh, let's just finish this off. Uh, in that way, Master Gautama, there is a discovery of truth. In that way, one discovers the truth. Uh, in that way, we recognize the discovery of truth. Uh, but in what way, Master Gautama, is there final arrival at truth? Uh, in what way does one finally arrive at truth? We ask Master Gautama about the final arrival of truth. The final arrival of truth, Bharadvaja, lies in the repetition, development and cultivation of those same things. In this way, there is the final arrival at truth. So the point here is just that once you are a stream enterer, you know what the path is, you keep on doing it again and again and again, and as a consequence, eventually you become an arahant. Uh, that is the point of that last paragraph. Uh, but the point of this uh, sutta, the, why, the reason why I think it is interesting, uh, is that the way it talks about the practice of the path, how the practice of the path is so much focused on understanding, on reflecting, yeah, on uh, thinking about the suttas, gaining this right view, which is so important to propel everything else. Uh, this really shows you how this reflect reflection process uh, forms a very, very important part of the path. Uh, and uh, I must admit, for me, it has taken a long time in my monastic life to really understand the power of right reflection. Uh, because once you think in the right way again, uh, you understand where you should be heading, what is really worthwhile. Uh. So this is, uh, I think, one of the powerful messages of this sutta, uh, and uh, why it is really, really worthwhile. There's a lot of other messages as well, and one of the other messages is the message that uh, uh, we have to take responsibility for ourselves. Uh, we have to investigate carefully the teachers and teachings around us, uh, and not just rely on others to guide us. Uh, Ultimately, we have self-responsibility. We have to be independent, basically. This is one of the messages here as well. Yeah. Okay, let's have a break. And if you have any questions about this, please write it down, and we will take those after the break. I'll see you back again in uh, at about 4 or 5.30 here.